All right, uh, as we are moving along in the, the year, uh, today is the uh, second Sunday in Lent, uh, and I purposely, uh, last week I had said it was the first Sunday of Lent, and I was reminded this week uh, by some online colleagues, uh, I, you know, I'd explained to you last week that, that when observing Lent, we skip Sundays, uh, because uh, Sundays are, they, they kind of, uh, surpass or supersede uh, the Lent observance. Uh, we are supposed to be celebratory on Sundays. It's the uh, day we commemorate the resurrection. Uh, and so Sundays aren't part of Lent. They get skipped. And so this is the second Sunday in Lent, not the second Sunday of Lent. There are no Sundays of Lent. There are only Sundays in Lent. So I've made that correction. Um, as we uh, begin. Uh, well, it turns out that two weeks ago was uh, uh, Transfiguration Sunday, and for that passage, kind of leading up to that, uh, we went to Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 33, and I want to read those again to kind of set the, set the scene uh, for today. Uh, so Mark uh, 8, 27 to 33, and uh, I have kind of discerned what's happening here. The, the version I have of PowerPoint at home uh, is a slightly newer version than the PowerPoint we have here. And so these slides that were perfect at home uh, are not perfect here. And that's a function of using different versions of PowerPoint. Uh, but uh, it has been fixed. Uh, Mark 8, uh, 27 to 33. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but, the, but merely human concerns. And so that's, uh, we jumped from there uh, several verses and picked up the transfiguration story, where Jesus went up on the mountain and was transfigured before them. So, so we, we stopped there. Technical pause. Okay, uh, we're back on track. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we stopped there and moved on to the Transfiguration story. So today I want to go back to the, to the passage, and actually I ended up shortening it to the next verse, uh, rather than the next passage, uh, that we actually skipped. So I want to call our attention today, today to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And so that's uh, our main theme today, uh, Mark 8.34. And I want to begin with that, uh, that opening sentence there, or the opening half sentence. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. 
So earlier, he had been talking specifically to his disciples, uh, his, his known followers, and now um, he calls the crowd to him. So uh, as it turns out, there's often a crowd around Jesus or nearby. Um, sometimes when they didn't want a crowd to be around them, there was a crowd around him. Uh, and so here he calls them to come close. And I think that Mark uh, re reports this because he wants to highlight the inclusive nature of the intended audience. Uh, and that is uh, every potential follower, not just elite followers. And I think sometimes we are guilty uh, of trying to separate the two. We think about those who are really devout. You know, they're, they're the saints, and, uh, and they're the, the super Christians, and we kind of separate them from the, the regular Christians or the ordinary Christians or the ordinary followers. And the reality is that the Bible doesn't really make a distinction like that. There aren't, uh, there aren't certain behaviors and customs and, and traditions and rules uh, for the elite Christians and a different set um, for the, uh, the ordinary Christians. Um, uh, once upon a time in my life, I was a chess enthusiast, and, uh, which meant that instead of just playing from time to time, I studied the game. Uh, I was a member of a, of a postal chess organization where I would have like 20 games going on at once with people all over the country, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so one of the books I read, was that I, I think I still own it, is called Chess for Fun and Chess for Blood. Uh, and it talked about the difference between the casual player, that's chess for fun, uh, and those who take it seriously, that's chess for blood. You know, you really want to... And, and you play differently uh, in those settings. Um, and so I think we, we want to apply that concept to how we live as Christians. Well, I don't want to get too carried away with it, and I don't want to work on it too hard. I'm just going to kind of be a casual Christian. <laughs> And again, the Bible doesn't make that distinction. You're either a follower or you're not a follower. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't separate categories. It's not Christianity for fun and Christianity for blood. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and so I think Mark is making that distinction here when he calls the crowd to him because he's talking about every potential follower. Uh, this applies to you if you want to be a follower of Christ. This isn't just for his disciples. And uh, then what he gives us uh, in the next half of that verse are two main qualifications or characteristics for would-be followers. Uh, he gives us two instructions. And that's what I want to spend uh, our time today uh, primarily looking at. Uh, and so it's pretty straightforward, really. Qualification number one, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. So I want to focus on that concept of what it means to deny themselves or to deny yourself or to, not, to deny oneself. Um, because it applies to everyone, um, he uses the word themselves, but it's really individual. Uh, it applies to each of us as a person. Um, <clears throat> last week, in introducing Lent, we talked about the tradition or the custom of giving up something for Lent. Uh, people often, well, you know, what are you giving up for Lent? And, and we went into that for a while. Um, but one of the things I said to you was that a, a more general or inclusive concept than fasting was that we use the term self-denial. So remember, Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. And it's that 40 days that gives us the 40 days of Lent. Um, and, but instead of encouraging everyone to fast for 40 days, um, we say to, to use self-denial. Uh, that is, uh, you know, to give up something. And we talked about some possibilities, um, like coffee, uh, time spent on your hobby. Uh, you know, that you can give up some of those things. We could add to that, you know, I'm going to give up dessert for, the, for these 40 days. I'm not going to eat out for these 40 days, and you know I'm not going to watch ball games on TV for 40 days. Uh, and so you can use that time and money 
uh, for God-honoring ways we talked about. Um, but but uh, today I, I want to kind of draw a distinction between self-denial and denying oneself. Uh, they don't mean exactly the same thing. Uh, and so I want to, uh, to differentiate those because we're being called not just to practice self-denial, but we're called to deny oneself. Um, so basically, self-denial is denying something. Coffee, dessert, television, you know. Uh, it, you know, giving up meat. Uh, maybe some people will uh, not eat meat on Fridays. I remember that as a kid. A lot of my uh, uh, classmates were part of a tradition where they, you know, we don't eat meat on Fridays. And, uh, and even across the restaurants today, uh, you'll see a lot of them will have uh, fish specials on Fridays uh, for those who aren't eating meat on Fridays. Fish was a good alternative for those people practicing that particular custom. Uh, and so thus was born the, fight, the Friday fish fry, and so on and so forth. So that's self-denial, denying something. Uh, <clears throat> denying oneself is deeper than that. It's choosing not to let yourself be your own boss. So it's really uh, saying no to you. Um, it's taking all those things that you want um, and saying no. Uh, you know, and we live in a culture, uh, we live in a time when we're constantly told the opposite. You know, uh, do, what, do what feels good to you. Do what you want to do. Stick up for number one, meaning yourself. And, and on and on and on it goes. Uh, our culture says that we should care about ourselves and prioritize ourselves and, and all of these things. And, uh, you know, there's a time and a place for that. Uh, you know, I, I love the, uh, the illustration of the, from the airlines. When they give you your pre-flight instructions, they tell you if, if the cashier suddenly, if the cabin suddenly depressurizes, uh, these things will drop down out of the thing ahead. Put your own on first, and then help those around you who are having trouble with it. And of course, the reason for that is if you don't put yours on first, uh, you might pass out and become incapacitated, and you won't be able to help those around you. You know, you've got to be breathing yourself before you can help those around you. And it's true, uh, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. So there's a sense in which, okay, you need to look out for yourself. Uh, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about prioritizing. Uh, and it's really about uh, exchanging self for God. Uh, so in denying self, we let God be master rather than being our own master. Uh, so instead of thinking, this is what I want, we ask the question, what does God want me to do or have? Uh, what, what is God's will for me, not what do I want for me? So I know, you know, back in college, um, a lot of people showed up knowing exactly what they wanted to do with life. Um, I was one of those who showed up thinking I knew what I wanted to do with life. i had only been in college for a few weeks or a month or so, and I realized that's not what I want to do with my life. Uh, and I became what, what we refer to as undeclared. What's your major? I don't have a major. I don't know. It's like, well, you've got, you, you, you have to declare by, you know, your, your second half of your sophomore year or whatever, you know. Uh, but until then, you can be undeclared. Um, and so what people are always asking, well, what do you want to do? Well, I had grown up in the church, and I had grown up, uh, had, had been saved as a child, and I did some drifting over those years. Uh, but the bottom line is, is, is I was asking the question, God, what do you want me to do? Uh, what is your will for my life? Uh, I believe that you have a plan, and I want to follow your plan, not my plan. Um, and uh, the truth is, of course, he works with you. Uh, a lot of times, um, 
your plan and his plan, if you're, a, if you're a follower, will overlap. He will kind of do something that he's already kind of put in your heart and mind to, to want to do yourself anyway. Um, <clears throat> so unlike some people, when I, uh, it, it took a while, but when I eventually felt that God was calling me to be a minister and to take this path, um, I didn't really fight that. It's not something I dreaded. I thought, well, you know, great. If that's what he wants me to do, great. I don't mind doing that. Um, that would be a fulfilling thing to do. Um, but, uh, but we're called upon to deny ourselves. And if you're not willing to deny yourself, you're not really going to be able to be a follower of Christ. Uh, that's just one of those qualifications. Qualification number two. Whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross and follow me. <clears throat> take up their cross and follow me. Now, we live in a time and a place where that can tend to lose some meaning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, back then, crucifixion was a Roman means of execution. Uh, you know, nowadays we use lethal injections and occasionally you'll hear about the electric chair uh, or, you know, uh, some type of a gas. Uh, but then crucifixion, the Romans did that often. It wasn't, Jesus wasn't the only one who was ever crucified. Well, it was a common procedure to make the condemned carry his cross to the place of execution. So if you're in jail, uh, and they say, you know, tomorrow we're going to crucify you, uh, we're going to do it out just on the outskirts of town, uh, on, the, on the hillside there, uh, on the path leading into town, so people can see you as they come and go. Uh, you get up that morning, uh, they would have the cross, or at least the cross bar, uh, and, they would, and they would make you carry it <laughs> from, from the jail out to the place where they're going to use it. And so, uh, so they were all familiar, uh, all of Jesus' listeners, as he, as he made these remarks, that crowd, and all the people to whom Mark wrote the book of Mark. It, Mark's readers, uh, they were also familiar. When it talks about uh, taking up their cross, they knew that it meant carrying your cross on which you are going to be executed, which you are going to be crucified. Well, I think in today's age, We've cheapened it. And, and I mean the Christian church in America. I think we have cheapened it because it's become a figure of speech um, almost for the trivial. I don't want to use the word trivial, but you'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, and, and the figure of speech is, we will often hear a Christian say, that's the cross I have to bear. That's the cross I have to bear. And by that, they might mean, I have a rude neighbor. That guy's just so grouchy, and, uh, and he just does, you know, uh, all he cares about is his lawn. He'll blow his leaves into my lawn, and, you know, he, he just, uh, you know, and he's always yelling at the neighborhood kids if they step on his lawn, to stay out of their lawn, and on and on it goes. And, uh, and, the, and the Christian will say, that's just the cross I have to bear. Because I'm a Christian, I'm going to put up with that. Uh, I'm following Jesus' words to carry my cross. Or maybe it's an overbearing boss. Anybody ever had an overbearing boss? I used to have a boss I, when I was a college student. No, high school student. Uh, at, between college and high school that summer, I worked for a restaurant called Bill Knapp's which was like a nice sit-down restaurant. Uh, and the manager, I was a busboy, and the manager, when it was busy, he would walk up behind you. You got a bus tub at a table, and you're pulling dishes off the table. Pulling the he would come up behind you and stand there, kind of lean over and say, are you hurrying? Are you hurrying? You need to be hurrying. And, uh, and he'd do that a lot. And it was so annoying. Uh, and you get so upset with him, uh, and he made it hard to do your work. But uh, <clears throat> as a Christian teen, well, that's just the cross I have to bear. 
Instead of punching my boss in the face and losing my job, I'm going to put up with it because I have this Christian attitude of tolerance. Uh, arrival at work or school, uh, maybe you have seasonal allergies. Uh, you know, you sneeze, well, that's just a cross I have to bear. I'm going to put up with this. Well, you know, all of those are legitimate problems. They're legitimate burdens. And I don't want to downplay them more than they need to be downplayed. But I want to stress the fact that none of those rise to the level of cross-bearing. Uh, being executed by crucifixion, you know, giving your life is not the same as putting up with a, a rude neighbor. Uh, putting up the rude neighbor can be hard, and you need to pray about it, uh, and you need to do it. Uh, but it's not cross-bearing. Now it is true that in this time and place, again, I'm talking about here in America in the 21st century, we're not often called upon to be martyrs. Uh, I don't know um, another Christian colleague in my lifetime that has been told to uh, forsake God or die. Now, I know they exist in other parts of the world, and I can read about them in history, and we read a lot about them in the Bible, but it's not really happening in, in America today. Uh, however, I think that uh, we must be willing. We have to live in that kind of place where, uh, where it's like, well, I'm not being asked to die tomorrow because I believe in God. But if you were asked to die tomorrow for believing in God, would you be willing? Would you give your life uh, if, if it was, you were called upon to do so? I think perhaps uh, even more relevant to where we live uh, is the idea of being a living sacrifice. Where Paul in Romans says, in view of God's words, as I encourage you, uh, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. And so the idea is, is you're giving your life to God, not by dying, but by living for Him. That idea of denying the self, you're going to stop doing what you want and do what God wants. Remember Jesus praying right before He died? Father, not my will, but Yours be done. That's one of the ways that we give our lives that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We're offering our life to him, uh, even if he doesn't want us to die for it. I think Paul uh, was a great example uh, when he writes <clears throat> in the, the book of Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that kind of fair? When you give yourself to God, you're really doing what he did for you first. He became human and died on a cross for you, and now he's asking you to give your life for him. Again, most often... Not by dying, but by living for him. <clears throat> that is to die to self and live for him. That means things like your priorities, your decisions, uh, your life plans, uh, your, you know, all of those things, you live by his priorities uh, instead of yours. Uh, you live by the decisions he wants you to make instead of yours. Uh, that's part of all that it means uh, to take up your cross and follow him. So to review, to kind of finish up, two qualifications for Christ followers from Mark 8, 33. <clears throat> Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And we can attach numbers to those. The two things, one and two, deny themselves Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, that's if you want to be a follower of Christ. Let's pray.